Okay, so we're going to get started, everyone. Thanks for coming out, um, and also for your patience, and we all know what it's like getting up to New York. It can be quite um, a burden sometimes, but thanks very much. So my name is Heidi Matthews. If I don't know you, I'm an assistant prof um, here at Osgood. Um, and I'd like to just briefly welcome you all to what is actually the second lecture in a new series. This is our inaugural year. Um, the series is titled Emerging Trends in Criminal Justice. And it's hosted by the Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights and Private Security. Um, and as, as I said, organized by myself, Professor Pichoko is here, and also Professor Tongi Renaud, who couldn't be here today. Um, and the primary aim of these seminars, I think, is to create an interdisciplinary space to address some of the most pressing and difficult problems facing uh, criminal justice today within Canada, but also globally. And so Professor Fisher's intervention today will help us hopefully think in more global terms. Um, and we understand these talks uh, as an exercise in methodological cross-training, let's say. So in other words, bringing together speakers at work from a diverse set of starting points uh, with the idea that we can build a unique criminal justice network um, with a unique set of expertise. And so we're driven to frame problems conceptually um, prioritizing substance over attention to, uh, let's say, disciplinary boundaries. So I'm very pleased, as I said, to be presenting Professor Talia Fisher. Um, her talk today is titled The Use of Statistical Evidence in the Criminal Justice System. Professor Fisher comes to us from the Buckman Faculty of Law at Tel Aviv University, but is also visiting at the University of Toronto, I believe, this year. Um, and she's, her work is concerned with empirical analysis of law, and she teaches and researches in the areas of evidence, private ordering, alternative dispute resolution and negotiation theory. So I think we're gonna speak for about 30 minutes, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Uh, yeah, and then we're gonna try. open it up to a and a So if you could join me in welcoming Professor Fisher. Hi everyone. And I apologize for miscalculating uh, the time it would take me to get from Toronto uh, here. Uh, and I will be presenting um, a project that is co-authored with uh, Professor David Enoch from Hebrew University. Um, and earlier versions of this project, it's an ongoing project, uh, were developed with uh, Dr. Levy Spector of the Open University, and actually um, we're, we're now currently working on an extension of this project, so uh, you know, your, your comments uh, will be greatly valued uh, because uh, this is the, there's a possible new venue that we're um, looking into these days. Um, so the issue of statistical evidence has been the subject of a heated and ongoing uh, debate um, in evidence law scholarship. Uh, courts and legal scholars um, often view statistical evidence uh, with suspicion, treating it as inadmissible, even when it is probabilistically or statistically equivalent to individualized um, evidence. And the object of our project was to try to formulate a comprehensive answer to the statistical uh, evidence uh, puzzle um, with uh, implications from th for the criminal justice system, uh, which I will highlight uh, today. For those of you unfamiliar with um, the statistical evidence puzzle in evidence law scholarship, so a good starting point would be uh, the blue bus hypothetical or uh, the gate crasher paradox, um, which I will describe Briefly, we didn't uh, formulate these uh, paradoxes. Of course, they're very, very well known in the evidence law scholarship. Uh, so I'll start with the blue bus paradox, which is a version of, or a variant uh, of a real case, the Smith versus rapid uh, transit. Um, and the hypothetical goes as follows. So suppose um, we have uh, two cases or two scenarios. Uh, under both scenarios, um, a pedestrian was hit by um, a bus a runaway bus that injures uh, the pedestrian, um, and she sues in a regular tort claim. Um, she sues uh, the blue bus company. Under the first scenario, we have an eyewitness testimony uh, identifying the hitting bus as belonging to the blue bus company. Now, suppose we take um, everything into account. You know, uh, this is a reliable witness, but of course not. Um, perfectly reliable. And after we take all the considerations into account, suppose that the probability uh, level of her testimony is, amounts to 70%. In such a case, um, this 
testimony would be taken, would pragmatically be taken into account um, against the Blue Bus Company. Perhaps we would even, the court would even be willing to hold the company liable based on this eyewitness testimony in a civil trial. Now, imagine the following scenario. The same uh, tort claim against the Blue Bus Company, but this time the only piece of evidence that we have is uh, a market share showing that 70% of the buses in the particular jurisdiction belong to the Blue Bus Company. In this case, most courts and most laymen as well um, would not be willing to base civil liability on this uh, piece of evidence, even though it is uh, probabilistic probabilistically on par with the eyewitness testimony. Um, and the, the question is why? In terms of uh, rate of error or overall rate, rate of error in the system based on both types of evidence, we would reach the same results. Um, the probative weight seems to be the same. So the question is, um, the question is why would be willing, we would be willing to take um, the eyewitness testimony as a valid piece of evidence, but hold the statistical evidence as inadmissible. So this is the, gate, uh, the blue bus paradox. Uh, the gate crasher paradox is um, as follows. Uh, suppose that it is uncontested that out of a thousand people who attended some stadium event, only 10 people purchased tickets. So we know that a, a thousand people viewed the concert or the sports uh, competition, but only 10 had purchased uh, tickets. Can we sue or even prosecute any individual attending the um, event based on this statistical evidence alone? And most would say definitely not prosecute, but not even in the civil cases, we would not um, be able to hold a person liable on, for gate crashing based on the fact that only 10 of 1,000 people purchased tickets to the game that he or she attended. Um, on the other hand, if it were some kind of individual, individualized or individuating piece of evidence, like a videotape with the same you know, probabilistic um, level, we would have we would easily use this videotape against um, the, the potential great crasher. And the question is, how can we explain, how can we justify the distinction between statistical and individuating evidence? This is the puzzle in evidence law scholarship. Now, a good um, way to, um, a good way, I think, to appreciate the depth of a problem is to look at the attempts that have been made to deal with it, to, uh, to vindicate this distinction. Um, but before I go into those uh, theoretical uh, attempts, I just want to say something about the way courts treat um, th these distinctions. So if we look at the legal doctrine um, on this matter, there is uh, some perplexity we see a lot of what seems to be local inconsistencies. So we have Smith versus Rapid Transit where the court was unwilling to admit the market share evidence. But um, in other cases, such as uh, Hertz versus Kaminsky, where the market share was not 70% or 85%, but it was higher, um, the courts were willing to admit um, the, this statistical evidence and to take it into account in a civil trial. So we have local inc inconsistencies, but we also have categorical, what seems to be categorical inconsistencies, um, because if we think DNA evidence, right, DNA matches our statistical um, evidence, and this is actually considered very, uh, not only admissible in criminal trials, but even uh, sometimes we, uh, in certain systems, it can be used as the sole or the exclusive piece of evidence uh, for conviction, even in the face of, um, you know, counteracting uh, individuating evidence. So we see that some statistical evidence is treated with suspicion uh, by the courts, DNA fully endorsed. Um, so as I said, I would like to give you like just a very, uh, very, very rough sketch of some of the general explanations 
and justifications that have been offered in the literature to date and why we think that they are not sufficient or they do, don't um, fully contend with the problem. And of course, uh, feel free to stop me at any point uh, if you want to ask or add something. Uh, um. So one uh, type of um, justification offered in the lit literature can be termed uh, something that which, which relies, or justifications which rely on exogenous considerations. For instance, um, Posner's claim that the very resort to statistical evidence is indicative of the probative weakness of the case. Right? In other words, that the um, statistical level is not equivalent to evidentiary weight because statistical evidence tends to show up when there is a weak uh, evidentiary basis. Um, the reason we think this is not, this doesn't do the job or is not a, a enough of a justification is for the following reasons. First of all, there's, um, w this needs to be substantiated using empirical data. So we have to show that statistical evidence is brought before the court uh, only against the background of a weak case or otherwise weak case. Um, so some empirical work needs to be done here. But even if we assume this empirical data correct, this can be a function of the legal regime as opposed to something which justifies or explains the suspicion of the legal regime towards uh, um, statistical evidence, right? So in a world where uh, statistical evidence is considered by the courts inferior to individuating evidence, this would be the last piece of evidence that I would, right? And I would only, this would be like my last resort and I would only use it in my case if I don't find, you know, individuating, good individuating evidence. But suppose the regime where you know, the opposite, and suppose uh, statistical evidence was considered superior to individuating evidence, right? This would be the first piece of evidence that I would uh, grab and, and not the residual uh, or last resort one. Um, so, and, and the third, I think, the strongest uh, answer that we have to Posner is that suppose I take this into account um, and that, that, you know, that the statistical factor is not the evidentiary weight and that it tends to show up only against the background of uh, a weak evidentiary climate, well, I can simply discount, right? I can simply discount or update my posterior ad to take into account this um, background condition. So 90% uh, market share would be the equivalent of a 70% probative weight. But even after taking this into account and discounting it, most people would object to using the statistical evidence, even after it was discounted. So this can't be you know, the thrust of the uh, problem, because even after this updating process, most people would have a strong intuition against using the market share evidence. Um, a second type of objections is that the defendant ought not to be punished merely for belonging to a reference class. Um, now, this is, of course, we, of course, wholeheartedly agree. We're just trying to find out why this is the case. Um, but what we can also say is that to conceptualize the use of statistical evidence in this manner is highly misleading, okay? If, if John were to be convicted for gate crashing based on the statistical evidence, he wouldn't be uh, punished for belonging to the reference class. He would be punished for gate crashing. Um, and we would just learn the, the indication or the, the uh, um, epistemic way to, to find this out is through the use of statistical evidence. And here it's tempting to emphasize that at the end of the day, all evidence is ultimately statistical, right? So just as in the case of eyewitness testimony, we wouldn't be saying that John is convicted because he belongs to the class of individuals who um, would be identified by the eyewitness as gate crashing, right? We'd say he'd be um, punished for gate crashing, and we just learn it from the eyewitness testimony. Similarly, uh, with the case of statistical evidence, this is just an indication. It's not, you know, the reason for uh, punishment. Um, a third type of um, objections by you know, a very well-known paper by Charles Nesson, 
uh, it refers to uh, legitimacy considerations. Um, and the claim is that verdicts or um, you know, judicial rulings that are based on statistical evidence are considered socially unacceptable and uh, infringe upon the public trust that the judicial system enjoys. Um, what I can say with this, uh, with this uh, objection, first of all, I think there's uh, room to question the intrinsic uh, value of public trust in the system. I think uh, the system should function in a way that merits public trust, but facilitating public trust in a system that does not merit a public trust, I'm not sure is, is a, an objective we should aspire to. Uh, but even if it is, there's an empirical question again, how, it, how do we facilitate public trust in any institution and in the court specifically? Um, moreover, even if um, this is a worthy endeavor, um, you know, facilitating trust, and we have the empirical data of how to achieve this, excluding otherwise probative evidence in order to achieve this end, could be questionable in and of itself. So, uh, you know, not the, the end doesn't justify all means. Sometimes we would say, okay, so we should educate the public rather than exclude otherwise probative evidence. So, um, because of this, we, we, we don't think that this explanation is enough. And, and there are others uh, that I would be hap happy to address uh, during the Q and A. And if you have um, other ideas, I'd be happy to hear. But we think that the um, literature up to date has not provided. Um, uh, convincing ans answer. Um, and our claim is that in the beginning of an answer to this puzzle is if we move away from the legal arena to uh, the literature on epistemology. And that the suspicion towards statistical evidence can be understood as part of uh, a broader epistemological uh, discussion and it's premised on the notion of sensitivity. So, this is um, one version of the lottery paradox in the epistemological literature. Okay, so at this point I'm just moving away from the legal arena for a second, we'll, be, we'll return to the legal arena soon. Uh, to provide you with one version of the lottery paradox, not, not you know, something that's well known in epistemology, not something that we have uh, contributed to uh, in any way, but the contribution is to, to, in, to um, incorporate it into the legal thinking. So the version of the lottery paradox, is, uh, this version is as follows. So suppose you buy a lottery uh, ticket where the chances of winning are one in a million. Uh, you hold on to the ticket for a day, and the winning ticket has now been announced, but you don't know the results. At this point, do you know that your ticket is not the winning ticket? Okay, right. So most people would say no. You know, I might uh, believe that it's not the winning ticket. I might be willing to sell it for very cheap because I believe that it's not the winning ticket, right? I might uh, be willing to gamble against it, but I don't know that this is um, not the winning ticket. Now, uh, uh, suppose the following. Again, we have a lottery um, you know, of, of tickets. This time the odds are better. They're not one in a million, they're one in a thousand. Okay, you buy the lottery ticket with a one in a thousand chance of winning. You hold on, on to the ticket for a day. The winning ticket has been picked. Um, and you find the winning number in today's local newspaper, and it's not your ticket. It's a different um, number. Suppose that after you found, but, but of course, now the, the newspaper is very reliable, but of course it's not perfect. Uh, suppose after you factor everything in, okay, there's like a one in a thousand chance that it is mistaken. So after you factor everything in, there's a one in a million chance that your ticket is the winning ticket despite not having appeared in the newspaper. Now if I ask you now, after you've seen the newspaper, right, do you know that your ticket is not the winning ticket? 
Most people would say here, yes. I mean, some people would say no, even in this case, right, that they have a one in a thousand, and then they saw a different number in the newspaper, which is very, you know, one in a thousand, um, it's like a very reliable newspaper. So some people would still say no, but that's like people who would, you know, gen generally have like skepticism uh, about, you know, how we, if we know something about the world. But most people in this scenario would say we do know. Now, again, if you, um, if you look at the two scenarios, right, they're probabilistically on par. But in the first scenario, most people would say there's no knowledge. And in the second scenario, they would say there is knowledge. And the, the question is, what is the difference between these two scenarios? And, sorry. <laughs> And uh, a reasonable answer, there are others that I, I can also highlight later on in the Q&A, but one reasonable answer makes use of the counterfactuals, okay? What would you have believed in both scenarios had your ticket been in fact the winning ticket, okay? So under the first scenario, where all you have is just the you know, statistical information that one in a million wins, uh, you would still have believed that your ticket was not going to win, even if it was the winning ticket, right? But in the second scenario, your belief is formed partly on the basis of what appears in the newspaper. And what appears in the newspaper, while is not perfect in any way, right, s is still, so we're assuming, if it's a reasonably reliable paper, uh, at least reasonably sensitive to what had actually occurred. So in the second scenario, right, um, your belief is sensitive to the truth. Okay. It's not infallible, but it is sensitive to the truth. So, so had your ticket, in fact, been the winning one, in all likelihood, this is what would have appeared in the newspaper. And these th this, again, this whole entire discussion is taking place in the epistemological literature, uh, which is, you know, obsessed or interested with the question of what constitutes knowledge and what is a necessary condition for knowledge. And sensitivity uh, in this literature is, has epistemic significance. Um, so when a true belief of ours is one that we would have held on to, irrespective of the truth, um, this belief is not adequately sensitive to the truth. And in that sense, it's sort of an epistemic accident, right? So it's uh, accidental that it is indeed true. If we would have hel held on to it, even if it weren't true, the fact that we hold on to it and that it is true is an epistemic accident. It is not a responsible way to formulate or form knowledge. Um, so sensitivity, if we look at the two scenarios, which is what distinguishes the two, um, is in this way, uh, uh, can be conceptualized as a necessary condition for knowledge. This is why, in the first scenario, we didn't talk in terms of knowledge, and in the second scenario, we do think of it as, um, as formulating knowledge, because the second um, scenario, in the second scenario, our belief was sensitive to the truth in a way that our belief in the first scenario was not. Okay, and so I'll just uh, go back to the um, sorry. definition of sensitivity here. So sensitivity, so S's belief that P is sensitive, if and only if, had it not been the case that P, S would not have believed that P. And sensitivity, according to this formulation, is, or, or these, uh, this version of the paradox, is an essential component of knowledge. Um, even if it's not essential for knowledge, uh, it's, we can say that, it is a, that um, a belief that is not sensitive right, is epistemically inferior to one that is. Okay? So up until now, um, any questions, comments? I just yes? want to ask you to tell me what equals BF means. If and only if. Oh, okay. So that's okay. not philosophical. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, So, <laughs> okay, so now 
using this notion of sensitivity, uh, let's return to the statistical evidence arena. So the two evidence scenarios in the blue bus hypothetical are parallel to the two lottery scenarios. I hope you can see that, right? The, the market share, or the statistical evidence, right, is like the first scenario of the lottery paradox, right? And it does not fulfill the condition of sensitivity. The eyewitness testimony, like the newspaper, right, she's not infallible, she's not perfect, her testimony is not perfect, but it is sensitive to the truth in a way that the market share evidence is not sensitive. Okay? And therefore, the market share is epistemically inferior to the eyewitness testimony. Now, I want to say something about this sensitivity um, requirement. Not all individuating evidence, not all eye testimony, eyewitness testimony, fulfill the condition of sensitivity, right? We can imagine a witness who is um, interested in framing the Blue Bus Company and would testify, right, that the Blue Bus Company is implicated irrespective of the truth, right? Um, so not, or, or she can be unreliable for other reasons, right? So not every individuating piece of evidence fulfills the conditions of sensitivity. The thing is that good, reliable eyewitness testimony, while not perfect, right, fulfills the conditions of sensitivity. It is sufficiently sensitive to what had occurred. It, had, it is sufficiently, um, um, it reverberates the truth, sensitive to the truth. Um, while, so, so good eyewitness or good individuating testimony fulfills the condition of sensitivity, while in the statistical evidence realm, even good statistical evidence is never sensitive, okay? So I'm not saying that all newspapers would, you know, not, not all newspaper scenarios would um, merit, you know, a, a sense of, like fulfillment of the sensitivity requirement. So if the newspaper um, just, you know, uh, publishes numbers irrespective of what had occurred, it wouldn't be sensitive information, but good, reliable newspapers right, are sufficiently sensitive to the truth um, to fulfill the conditions of, of sensitivity, while just the background statistics of, you know, one in a million shot in um, the lottery or uh, the market share uh, evidence is, even if it's highly probative, is never sensitive, okay? So this is the first part of our project. Um, this, is, this provides an explanation for, um, an ex this provides an explanation for the suspicion towards statistical evidence. So we think that the way, that, that the reason that um, statistical evidence is treated with suspicion, both by lawyers and by lay people, is rooted in their epistemic inferiority and the fact that they are insensitive to the truth. Okay. Now, we move on to the second part of our uh, project, which is to ask, well, what's law got to do with it? Okay, so um, there is an epistemic distinction between statistical evidence and between individuating evidence, but is this epistemic distinction of significance in the legal arena? And our answer to this is no. Um, so before I, I go on to explain our answer, I'll just say then that because our answer is no, we think that, so, so on the one hand, we provided some answer to the puzzle, right? We pointed to a distinction which was something that people in the literature were looking for, to a substantial epistemic distinction between these two types of evidence. And that way we answered part of the, uh, the, the, the puzzle. But this, is, this only provides an explanation for the suspicion towards statistical evidence, 
not a justification of this suspicion. It doesn't justify. Why? Because we think that this epistemic distinction is irrelevant to the law. Why is it irrelevant to the law? Because law is the enterprise of guiding social behavior. Law is, in, law, uh, is interested in incentives. And for incentives, accuracy is of great value. But excluding statistical evidence, right, is uh, reaching lower accuracy levels in the systems. It, it, in that way, impairs the main enterprise of law, which is um, incentives setting. Right? Statistical evidence can improve the court's accuracy. It can serve to minimize error in the system just as much as individuating evidence. So, so let's put it more mildly. Um, if there were no toll in terms of accuracy, perhaps you know, it's okay to prefer epistemically superior evidence to epistemically inferior. But given a toll in terms of accuracy, we think that the legal arena um, should not seek sensitive, uh, should not seek, seek outcomes based on sensitive evidence alone. Okay? Put it this way suppose I could give you a choice to live in a system that is more accurate, that reaches correct results at a higher rate, but uses both sensitive and non-sensitive evidence, or to live in a system that reaches lower accuracy levels, but uses only sensitive or epistemically superior uh, types of evidence, I think most of us would prefer to live in the former or not in the latter. So when we have to pay a price in terms of accuracy for excluding non-sensitive evidence, um, so, so we think you know, uh, that this is an ex ex um, a condition that is external to the law. So, if I ha sum up until now, we found a distinction, an epistemic distinction between these two types of evidence, but this does not justify the suspicion towards them in uh, the legal arena. However, this is not the end of the story. So the story of sensitivity as an epistemically relevant condition may be thought of not as a vindication, as I said, of the distinction, <coughs> but um, rather as an explanation of it. So it diagnoses the, the relevant intuitions, but it doesn't justify them. So this is the third part. What should law care about? As I said, um, incentives. And here we move to a paper you may uh, be well familiar with, uh, Kristen Curico's paper on bad character evidence. So um, to sum up for those who don't, like very, very briefly, uh, so Curico's project generally in the evidence law scholarship is to point to the effect of evidentiary regimes on primary behavior, on you know, the, our decision to engage in certain activities um, so Sankirika says, you know, we, uh, we oftentimes think of evidentiary and procedural rules ex post. So after, you know, the accident has occurred, after the contract has been breached, after the alleged crime has taken place, now, you know, how the evidentiary regime affects the presentation of evidence at trial, in the shadow of the upcoming trial. But Sankirika asks us to take into account the incentive setting features of evidentiary rules. Um, how, ev how the evidentiary regime exposed, at trial exposed, after dispute, would affect the uh, occurrence of a dispute to begin with. How it would affect our tendency to comply with the contractual um, you know, conditions. Uh, to uh, engage in the offense or not engage in the offense. So he looks at the ex-ante effects of, um, of evidentiary rules. And he shows in the case of bad character evidence, he says, we can't explain bad character evidence if we think only of the epistemic function of um, trial. Because bad character has probative value. We can understand this you know, bad character evidence rule from an ex-ante perspective in terms of the 
of that, you know, the, the negative effects in terms of deterrence that it causes. So, so here's the model very, very briefly. He, he explains as follows. Suppose I um, walk around with a prior conviction, and I'm now deliberating whether to engage in a future offense, in another offense. Now, the, in a world in which bad character evidence could be used against me for this second offense, in, in a trial for this second offense, the payoff for not engaging in it becomes lower, right? So, because um, the expected sanction if I do not engage in the second offense, given the bad character which could be taken into account, is higher, thereby the marginal difference, right, between the payoff, um, the, the expected sanction if I do and if I don't, which is the price of the offense, becomes lower. So there's a negative effect in terms of deterrence for bad character evidence. Okay? So this is, the, if you want, this is the utilitarian based case against using bad character evidence. Of course, we can think of you know, other deontological justifications. Uh, but this is a utilitarian based case that shows that if we use this evidence, it has a negative effect in terms of incentives not to engage in the second offense after you have already had a prior conviction. And Sankirko's general strategy can be easily applied to statistical evidence as well, right? So if there's like a statistical evidence that says that males are implicated in violent crimes more than females. If we use this background statistic is something that um, is not affected by my conduct, but, is, but if it can be used against me, lowers right, the um, marginal price of engaging in the offense. Because whether I do it or whether I don't, the chances of conviction become higher and the difference between them becomes then lower. Okay? Um, so. Uh, this is the incentive-based justification against using statistical evidence. Okay? Now, our claim is that there is an interesting convergence between the incentive-based case against statistical evidence and the epistemological sensitivity-based case or not case, or explanation, uh, or intuition against statistical evidence. Because look at the structure. Right? Both are based on the similar types of sensitivity like counterfactuals. Look at the structure. In terms of incentives, or John who is deliberating whether to purchase a ticket is thinking in terms of if I gate crash, right, they'll punish me. If I don't, they won't. This is like the way incentives work, right? Um, but the conditional, if I don't gate crash, they won't punish me, corresponds with the counterfactual, um, you know, from the sensitivity, uh, epistemological sensitivity counterfactual. Had he not gate crashed, we would not have punished him, right? So you see the similarity in the structure, and this is all I can say, because we don't know if it's, uh, what, what is there beyond the similarity in the structure. But, but it's interesting to see you know, the, the convergence here. So while the epistemological story is not itself of legal value, it is only something which can explain the prevailing intuitions, but it's not something that justifies them, so it has no legal value in and of itself. And while the instrumental in incentive-based story that is of legal value is not itself epistemologically <laughs> driven or uh, respectable, both of them stem from the same source of sensitivity style counterfactuals. So what I want to say is that um, at, at the end of the day, or ultimately, our claim is that what should drive policy considerations are the incentives that are at the heart of legal logic. So it is incentives which drive the policy and not epistemological considerations of sensitivity, but that there is an interesting conflation or convergence between, sensi between uh, the epistemological story and the instrumental story because of those sensitivity-based um, counterfactuals. Okay, so this is the model. This is like the analytical model. Now I'll show how it unveils in the um, uh, criminal justice arena, okay, how it 
translate legal doctrine. Do I have uh, like five more minutes to do that? Okay. So what I'll do is um, I'll take, uh, I'll be happy during the Q&A to, to uh, you know, address additional issues like exonerating versus incriminating evidence or sufficiency versus admissibility. Uh, but in the, for the presentation, I chose just two endpoints, okay? Um, DNA, which is statistical evidence that is endorsed, um, and propensity for crime, which is uh, uh, really a not, not um, which is considered like the ultimate inadmissible type of evidence. Okay, so these two endpoints, I'll try to explain um, using our model. I'll try to show you how our model can explain the seeming dis seemingly disparate uh, treatment of these two endpoints um, by the legal doctrine, okay? And I'll start with propensity for crime. Um, so in terms of propensity for crime, uh, we claim that while Sankirika's point is very valid in terms of the effects of evidence law on incentives, he chose um, a, a, the wrong arena. Okay, that the bad character arena is not the best example for his case. And actually, statistical evidence or propensity for crime evidence is a better choice. Okay? So um, I'll just show you maybe on the blackboard, it's going to be easier. Okay? So Sankirico says like this. He says, um, here's offense number one for which I have been convicted. Okay? Now, at this point, I'm deliberating here whether to engage in offense number two. And, and um, what Sankirico says is that if at this point, the trial for offense number two, bad character evidence as to my involvement in offense number one would be admitted into court, this would have a chilling effect at this point. When I'm deliberating whether to engage in um, offense number two, right, the marginal cost would be decreased if this evidence were to be admitted at trial, right? This is his case. So he says it's not enough to look ex post after uh, offense number two allegedly took place. We have to look ex ante. But when he turns our view ex ante, it's to this point after offense number one has already been committed and before offense number two has been committed, right? Now, there's a peculiar question here, right? Is why are we only interested in eliminating offense number one, uh, offense number two, I'm sorry, right? As a society, we want to eliminate offense number one as well, okay? Now let's, if, if he suggests in Kiriko to look ex ante, let's go ex ante to this point, be, while I'm deliberating whether to engage in offense number one, not just ex ante to the period between offense number one and offense number two. Now see what happens here at offense number one? when I'm deliberating whether to engage in offense number one, in a world in which bad character evidence would be used against me at the conviction phase of trial, I know that if I get caught, not only is there an expected punishment for offense number one, right, but subsequently I'll be at a risk of false conviction from then on, right? So the deterrent effect in terms of offense number one is actually higher if this information is admitted, right? So before offense number one, there's a positive um, value of deterrence, right? A po positive uh, deterrence effect for submitting um, evidence of bad character. After offense number one and before offense number two, right, there's a negative um, incentive effect. And the question is, which is, which is stronger, right? So, um, so maybe this is, you know, the best case. But now, let's look at propensity for crime, general propensity for crime. So suppose if you're young and you're male, right, that your propensity for crime is higher, and we were to use this type of evidence. Here, there's only the negative incentive. Why? Because we don't want and can't deter people from being young males, right? Unlike not committing a first offense, right, which is something we can and want to do, we can't and don't want to, we, we can't and want, sorry, uh, we can't and don't want to deter people from being young males. So here, in this case, there's only the negative incentive value 
uh, associated with using this uh, statistical evidence. And as I said, this incentive-based story is the reason why, uh, we, why the courts are justified in excluding this type of evidence from um, the evidentiary basket. Okay? So this is the propensity for crime story. Now I'll move to um, the DNA evidence which, as I said, is endorsed, is considered admissible, even sufficient basis for, pra for, pra um, for convicting. Um, and here, I think a few, you know, our model does the work uh, or justifies in a few ways. So first of all, in terms of ex post accuracy, this is not, this is like the most um, sort of uh, um, not inspiring in any way answer, but probably holds a lot of uh, water. And that is that in terms of uh, the cost in terms of accuracy of excluding this type of statistical evidence is very, very high, ex post accuracy. And you know, the Kaminsky versus Hertz, as opposed to Smith versus Rapid Transit, is the same story. When the market share is very high, there's a high toll in terms of um, accuracy to pay for excluding the evidence, like DNA. Um, so perhaps the courts are more reluctant. So this is um, one story from an ex post accuracy perspective. From the incentive perspective, we think that the, there's also, uh, our model also explains DNA evidence. Because unlike market share, um, which is usually, it's very simple to process, it's uh, accessible to people, people know very little about their, the frequency of their DNA profile, about what it, you know, what are the chances that it would be found, um, what, probative uh, weight it would be accorded. So the chilling incentive effect that we were talking about, you know, with propensity for crime, for instance, or with other types of statistic evidence, uh, don't, um, don't, these chilling effects are not as pronounced in the DNA arena. So in terms of the incentives, um, they don't dampen incentives the way other types of statistical evidence might dampen. And the sensitivity, um, even from a sensitivity perspective, DNA can be considered unique. Again, I want to stress, according to our model, it's not sensitive, the sensitivity um, rationale does not, is not supposed to play a part um, in, in the legal arena. So it's not the justification, but we can even say that even from this perspective, it might be unique. This is because of the proximity of worlds. So this is like the, count, you know, the relevant counterfactuals. So the claim here, is that a world in which um, I didn't commit the offense and DNA evidence was not found in the arena is of greater proximity, is closer to our world than a, d than a world in which um, I didn't commit the offense and, DNA and my DNA was found in the arena. So even from this the sensitivity perspective, DNA um, is unique. And I'll just end by saying that w w the, uh, um, a, lot, a lot can be said for a prevailing doctrine in light of our um, our theoretical uh, sort of uh, uh, model, but we also um, propose in its light some reform. So for instance, um, the use of statistical evidence at this point by the courts is not sensitive to the type of offense uh, in question, but we show that when there are crimes of a very personal nature, like domestic violence, for instance, um, this should also play a part in, in terms of admitting or not, not admitting statistical evidence. So suppose there is um, uh, statistical evidence according to which when there are cases of domestic violence, uh, or when, when, uh, sorry, when, when a spouse is like injured um, not in natural means, um, and, and she or he are married to, I don't know, philosophers, okay? Um, there's a high percentage that it is because of some criminal activity or some domestic violence, okay? So John the philosopher, he, there's this background statistic, but he knows that if he doesn't uh, act violently towards his spouse, right, most chances are that she won't be uh, injured in a non-natural way, right? So, um, and this is different from the gate crasher, where even if John doesn't gate crash, 999 other people will, right? Um, so, for instance, in this case, we think that it is legitimate and justified to use statistical evidence 
um, as opposed to the gate crasher cases. So this is, uh, you know, so we, we also offer some room for reform. So this is the motto, <laughs> and um, I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Hi. I really enjoyed uh, this presentation. I have many questions, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it uh, brief. Um, I guess my, my biggest skepticism about what you presented today, mm -hmm. which I, I think I followed it and it was really interesting and persuasive in many points, but I'm very skeptical about the claim that Sankariko's argument is so persuasive and that th this incentive thing is actually going on with respect to the type of evidence he's talking about. Like, even when we're talking about, say, minimum mandatory sentences of raising the robbery sentence from five years to 10 mm -hmm. years, there's a lot of doubt about whether that's actually getting through to the public mm -hmm, and creating mm -hmm. any incentives whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So to me, the idea that somehow people on the street are responding to procedural rules mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. some future trial seems totally absurd. Like, so I'm not at all convinced by that. It, it just seems to take the whole, the wind out of it. Now, I do acknowledge mm -hmm. that I, I think that there's something in your incentive analysis when you talk about things like, what if we took into account that people are more likely to be guilty if they're young and male? Like if it became, that's an outrage, right? That idea, and if it became known that you could be convicted just for being young and male, mm -hmm. that might actually have some, people would know about that mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that would affect their incentives. I just really am not convinced that we, that we can, these very detailed procedural rules that people on the street have no knowledge of are creating any incentives at all. That's yeah, my, my yeah. major concern. Yeah, okay, so, so this is you know, an excellent point. And, and this is a general point, I think, against economic analysis of, 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 of the procedural realm, right? Of civil procedure, criminal procedure, or um, evidence. So when, you know, I, I think I could address it at a different level. So one level is to say, okay, so then maybe just like I was you know, suggesting perhaps we should distinguish between types of offenses, maybe we should also distinguish between types of, you know, litigating parties. So maybe the very sophisticated repeat players, I don't know, you know, corporations or, uh, th so they, with respect to them, I think you would assume, right, a different, uh, and, and then we should, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, 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 fine tune right, our use of evidence generally and statistical evidence, specifically with respect to the sophistication of different, and, and you know, and that's a, that's a general, fathom, and perhaps I think this would, you know, this would address um, your, your concern. Um, moreover, I, I'm not sure, you know, that it is, I, I agree that people don't know all the nits and bolts of, you know, trials, um, but I, I don't think that it is something that it is, you know, that um, this like cost-benefit analysis is totally um, foreign or, or exterior to their decision-making process, so, right? So I think we can um, impact people's behavior by substantive law, right? So we can double the fine for certain activities, we can place twice the number of officers in the street, or we can lower the standard of proof. And I think that, you know, so some, I, I agree that some aspects may be at times more salient than others, but, you know, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it, it is, that ha has no <coughs> effect. It's, it perhaps this effect is mitigated by over optimism, by cognitive biases, by you know lack of information or lack of um, knowledge. It's it's like it seems to me um, sort of like a gray, right? It's not um, so. So this I think would be um, my my second point in this regard. I'll just say that as an anecdote. So essentially, what we're saying is that the intuition. The people's intuition is driven by epistemological considerations, but that you know, for the for policy implications and for the system and for creating incentive, incentives, it's it's the instrumental story. And I presented this uh, paper at a economics department, and they said, well, like their intuition were the incentives, like they said, the incentive story. That's the intuition, right? Like they thought the epistemology. So so for them, like they had a very different vision of what motivates people and how people ask, you know, act. So they think of all of us as sort of homo economicus, all like calculating you know, these cost-benefit analysis all the time. Yeah. 
clarification question. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't fully understand um, why was it that prior to the second offense in the theory, like mm -hmm. why does that have a negative deterrent offense? Because I mean, in fact, my intuition would tell me that it would have a positive deterrence effect to know that the threshold of evidence that's required um, to secure a conviction or whatever would would be lower. So I didn't really understand. <coughs> okay, so that. so um, I'll I'll try to answer and, and tell me if if. Um, I'm formulating correct, correctly what is bothering you, okay? So first of all, I just want to stress, of course, that um, Sankirko, Sankirko's model, right, still assumes that if I engage in the second offense, my expected punishment will be higher than if I choose not to engage in the second offense. But the question is, how much higher, okay? That's the question. The, um, the, the, Sanction, right? The criminal sanction, according to economic analysis, is the price we pay for the offense, and it is the difference in the payoff, right, between what would be my expected punishment if I don't engage, because there is still an expected punishment if we don't engage, right? There's false convictions out there, right? So even if we don't engage, we might be convicted for a crime, right? So there's an expected punishment if I don't, and there's an expected punishment if I do, and the difference between the expected punishment—that's the price. Now, if um, character, bad character evidence is admitted at the guilt phase, at the conviction phase of trial, it elevates my expected punishment if I don't engage, right? So if it elevates, if, it, if I do engage, it's still higher, but it's higher by a lower, right? Um, like the margin is, is smaller. So the price of the offense becomes lower, okay? Um, but you have a case in the following sense. Um, some people could say, well, you know, one reaction to this would be, if I'm in, the, in this, like, uh, as Sankirko says, right, I mean, uh, damned if I do, damned if I don't situation, I might as well enjoy the crime, right? This is like what Sankirko is saying. This is one type of reaction. The other type of reaction would be, well, I'll be a, if I have a prior conviction, I'll be especially careful, right? I won't roam the streets. So that I don't get, that, that I don't get, um, people aren't suspicious of me, right, for a second crime, right? So think about it like in a different context. Suppose, um, you know, our doctor says to us, our physician says to us, um, given your, I don't know, like your, your um, DNA profile, um, you're at risk for some, you know, for a cardiovascular disease at a very, very young age, right? Um, so you have a heightened risk. Right? So one type of reaction would be, like Sankirico says, well, I'm at this damned if I do, damned if I don't situation. If I'm going to, right, to, to uh, pass away at a very young age from cardiovascular disease, I might as well enjoy you know, my short life that I have. Right? This is what Sankirico says. But another reaction would be, oh, sorry, I think I have to, hold on to it. Another reaction would be, um, I'll be especially careful. Right? I'll, be, I'll, do, I'll exercise, I'll eat right. Right, um, and and here I agree with you. Right, so so this type of information could induce both types of reactions. So what I can tell you, if if this is like what you were uh, pointing to, so what I can answer is as follows. First of all, you know, um, I don't think that Sankirko is trying to tell us that incentives are the whole story, the entire story, and that this type of incentive or disincentive is the entire story. But it is something that we ought to take into account when we formulate evidence rules. So this is like one vector that we should think about. So, so long as there are cases out there that will react this way, that will be under careful rather than over careful, right? Um, and I think in this like physician story, I think it, it, a lot of it depends on the probabilities, right? So if it's a, a heightened by 7%, maybe you'll be extra careful. If it's heightened by 97%, you might You'll say to yourself, okay, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't, so I might as well enjoy life, right? That's, uh, so it also depends on where we are in the probability um, line. And the last thing I want to say, with respect to criminal law, right, we should be concerned with both types of reactions, because over-deterrence is also something we should be concerned about. We don't want as a society that people will refrain from engaging in, you know, uh, legitimate activities because they're afraid that they'll be convicted after they have a prior conviction. So over-deterrence is also something that we should be concerned about. So even if the reaction is one, as, is one of over-deterrence, it's still, you know, it's still uh, concerning. Okay. Um, 
Thanks. So this was this was very interesting. So so I want to ask about. So in a way, um, the two parts of the paper, the the part that's more relies on the epistemolo epistemological literature and the one that's more economic analysis, seem to me to be in tension in terms of their m model of human nature. Uh, and because because the epistemological literature peddles with intuitions, and as such, I think it reflects human biases, whereas, and then, and, and so, and to that extent, you, you, you say, I'm consistent, I'm presenting to you why doctrine is, is the mm -hmm. way it is, and then once I move to my recommendations, I'm, I'm sort of shifting gears to, to something else. But, so, so let me try and be uh, mm -hmm. clear. So, so, so one, a different way of, of explaining uh, what happens with statistical evidence and why people are troubled wi with it, I think, so it's not something I, thought much about before your talk, is uh, certain biases, or mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. the availability bias, I would say. Or so their representativeness. Right? Yes, their so, um, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so here's an, ex an everyday example. So you read in, in a sort of consumer's digest that a certain car is, is really reliable, and then your friend tells you, oh, I have this car, it's, it's crap. And mm -hmm. many, peop many people will rely on this one piece of mm -hmm. e mm -hmm. evidence. It becomes much more salient. Uh, against the, the consumer report, mm -hmm. which is probably rely, depends on many, many judgments. Mm -hmm. and, and I think to some extent, you can see the similarities mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. this story and, and what yeah, happens, and, right? So, and so to that extent, the problem that many people may have with statistical evidence is simply a bias. It's, it's, and, and as such, I agree with you, should probably not deserve our respect unless you have a theory about what law should be, which is, should be for humans, take humans mm -hmm. as they are and so on. But, okay, but then um, you say, um, when you move to, to the normative proposal, you, 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 you really adopt, and here I, I, I share Lisa's concern, that you really adopt kind of a very hardcore rational um, uh, choice model of, of, of human action and human choice. And then the question is, um, why, given that your starting point was, or the first part of the paper, seemed to accept that humans are not rational in this way? Um, and so, so that's, that's in a way one, one way of, of putting the, the, the the bigger mm -hmm, mm -hmm. picture question. Now, I have a small question about, about this. So you say, uh, we, we don't want to incentivize people not to be males and, um, and young, mm -hmm. and we can't. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we, we don't. Uh, no, so, so there's only the, the you know, negative exactly. incentives. So, but, but if I understood you, and I, I admit I didn't think hard enough, so maybe I'm mistaken here, but uh, think about the, um, being a high school dropout. Mm -hmm. So that would be something that is um, something that we may well want to incentivize people to not drop out of high school, and yet, if I know evidence law, would also be excluded, and yet your model would suggest that it should be included. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. okay, so, <laughs> so, okay, so thank you. So very helpful questions. I'm just going to write it down so I don't forget. Um, Okay, so I'll start with the first point. Um, so uh, statistical evidence and, and that character evidence have also been linked to, uh, you know, in, in the cognitive uh, behavioral um, literature to the representativeness um, bias, um, which is, uh, um, it's the undervaluation of the base rate when we, um, okay. Now, I agree that there are, perhaps, you know, biases in the processing of, of statistical evidence. The reason we don't think that this is the explanation is that we think there are biases it, with the use of individuating evidence as well. So, you know, I think, I think we should be concerned with biases in decision making and in judicial decision making. And of course, if there's, uh, if, if jurors or judges are biased in any way, we should deal with it. We just don't think that this is, you know, that this is the vindicating, uh, um, vindication of, of the statistical individuating evidence deb debate because it doesn't run along this axis. Because we can think of, you know, different biases in the processing of individual 
to lies eyewitness testimony, right? I may not believe women as much as I believe men, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So there are, now of course I'm saying this is not, and, and I want to emphasize again, this utilitarian incentive-based story that we tell for why it is legitimate and justified to exclude, you know, uh, propensity for crime evidence is not the only story. And of course, in addition, we can think of, you know, moral stories uh, that we, sh we should tell and, of course, that come into play, but this is another aspect. Um, now, but I want to answer, like, I, I don't want to evade your question, and I want to answer, like, on the more nor the normative, you know, and uh, going back to, like, Lisa and, and the rash. So I think one of the things that can be said for the economic analysis um, is that this method is, c can incorporate a lot of the things that we know about how agents actually behave in the world into the model. So if we have this like hyper, ra ra we had this hyper rational, you know, homo economicus after, you know, Kamen and Tversky and um, this uh, body of literature, right, we can now, um, because, because th this uh, literature on, you know, the, the heuristics and the cognitive biases that we're exposed to is, it shows systematic deviations from rationality and therefore predictable deviations from rationality. So we can in incorporate this into the model, right? If it's predictable. So we don't have to assume hyper-rationality in order to, um, you know, do this like incentive um, analysis. So perhaps, uh, uh, so, so this is like just uh, in terms of like the two parts of the, or the, the normative uh, discussion here. Now in terms of the, um, um, you know, the, the high school dropout uh, example. So, um, we, this is like our objection to um, Sankiriko, um, you know, but, but if your, your point about like valid, you know, about high school dropouts may be valid. I would a ask you then, but even if we want to disincentivize people from dropping out of high school, I'm not sure we would want to use the criminal justice apparatus for that, right? This might be like an overshoot. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's in Kiriko's story. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, the thing is, I, I don't think that in Kiriko's story, which, again, which I object to for the reasons that I mentioned, in, in part, um, can explain, you know, prevailing doctrine as is. For, for instance, the mercy rule, right, from an incentive-based perspective, the mer not, not our objection, like, not our ex-ante, but um, from St. Kiriko's perspective, right, the, so he says, you know, we should also eliminate the mercy rule because good reputation also has a chilling, disincentivizing effect, right? If I have a good reputation, I know that my probability of conviction, right, will be lower, right? So this might disincentivize me. And what I would say to him, like the mirror image of what, of our criticism uh, would say, well, we want to incentivize people to be, to build up a good reputation, right? So, um, so I don't think, you know, like I, I don't think that, he attempts to, and we definitely don't attempt to, like, um, explain each aspect of the uh, prevailing doctrine. Uh, okay. uh, I have two questions, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. Uh, the first philosophical and the second mm -hmm. is practical. Uh, the philosophical one is, are the rules the same? Mm -hmm whether we are talking about evidence that convicts as they oh. are, whether it exonerates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have a very specific case where I use statistical evidence to exonerate somebody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and that was readily accepted by the court, whereas the opposite wasn't, uh, may, uh, would not have been. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, uh, yes, okay, so this is a, just. a great question. And, and, um, and so again, it depends on the perspective, but I want to highlight the following. Um, in terms of accuracy, if what interests us is accuracy, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, n the, the uh, social cost of the errors in the criminal justice system are not the same, right? The social cost of false conviction is considerably higher than the social cost of false acquittals, right? So from an accuracy perspective, um, this could be um, the exposed costs in terms of social costs in terms of accuracy, right, could explain why we would use we would use statistical evidence for exonerating purposes, but ban them for convicting purposes. So, from an accuracy perspective, um, you know, 
we can, we can um, vindicate a distinction here. But notice from the sensitivity perspective, that's I think even more interesting. From the sensitivity perspective, notice this follows. When we acquit someone, okay, when we acquit, well, uh, sorry, when we convict someone, right, we aspire to knowledge, right, or to a belief that he or she are not implicated in the alleged crime, uh, are implicated, I'm sorry, in the alleged crime, right? When we acquit, acquit acquittal is not a belief that the defendant did not engage in the relevant crime, right? At most, it is not a belief that he, he or she did, but it is not a belief that he or she didn't, right? So we don't even aspire to knowledge or in that, in that way, right? So, of course, from this perspective, the, the distinction can be drawn. The more murky uh, issue is incentives. In terms of incentives, uh, I don't think you know, we can accommodate the distinction, but from sensitivity and from accuracy, um, a, a distinction can be drawn here between exonerating and, and convicting, and which is why we would, for instance, justify using statistical evidence for exoneration purposes, but not for conviction purposes. The, the, the second thing is, mm -hmm. is in, in your uh, project, was it primarily philosophical analysis of the legal doctrines, or was it based on actual studies that were made that you tried to use to apply to the theory? So we, most of the discourse in, in evidentiary theory is um, theoretical. Uh, there have been a few studies which we have um, used uh, which, were, which were sort of like empirical analysis of when courts tend to use statistical evidence and not. Um, and some of them we could also explain, like the tendencies. So for instance, courts tended to allow the admission of statistical evidence in conditions where individuating evidence would be very, very difficult to locate. And this could be explained or justified you know, um, from an incentive perspective, it's second incentives regarding secondary behavior and the accumulation and presentation of evidence. But there's not that much uh, empirical work that's done. There's some. Um, so, so one of my, my students is in now engaged in a um, psychological sort of behavioral approach to see how people react to statistical and to um, individuating evidence, but there's not that much empirical work out there about these subject matters. Still trying to formulate this, but let me try. Um, so, <coughs> in the philosophical literature, there's a parallel way of discussing this, which is in terms of Gettier conditions. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if mm -hmm. you have done this mm -hmm. in the larger paper, but it seems to me by framing it in terms of sensitivity, you have managed to evade, intentionally or unintentionally, some of the more interesting questions associated with the sort of epistemological question of the conditions of knowledge. So it's normally thought that what Gettier has shown us is that true knowledge mm -hmm. must not only be justified, but it must be truth tracking in a way that it eliminates luck. Mm -hmm. right, so that's one normal interpretation of Gettier. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm convinced that your account of sensitivity is luck independent in the way we would want it to be to be epistemologically, for it to epistemologically count as knowledge. Why would it not be luck independent? Well, well, so it seems to me that a lot of, if I've understood your definition correctly, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot of what you are saying is sensitivity is actually not independent of the factual circumstances. I mean, can you, if you maybe if you flip back to the slide, I can try to make mm -hmm, this clear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To the sensitivity yeah, definition? Yeah. Oh yeah, well even no. we could do it off the lottery slides if, if you like. Uh, the, 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 sh sh yeah, sure. So wait, oh this, right? Yeah, so I mean, okay. I'm inclined to think that the reason mm -hmm. we might believe scenario B is knowledge is that that's not luck in, that's not, that's not luck independent. Now are you saying that that is sensitivity independent knowledge or not? This is no, where, I, this this is is where I lost no, you. Scenario B is sensitive, 
and it is not an epistemic accident or epistemic luck. This is epistemic luck. If, you know, with relevant fact, counterfactual, if my ticket is the winning ticket, right, and I believe that it is the winning ticket, this is, here it would be epistemic luck. Here, it is linked to what had, had occurred, right? It is sensitive to the truth and therefore not an epistemic accident. Um, I'm, so I'm not sure I buy that because, I mean, so it, this may just be my thick-headedness, but it looks to me that it, at those level of odds that it is probably not, that it probably is still luck dependent, depending on what one takes the, the relevant, the relevant sti re requisite statistical evidence to be. So one, because clearly you would say at one point those mm -hmm. odds, say one in 10 mm -hmm, wrong, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. then going to be luck okay. dependent. Okay, so, 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 why, so I guess my point I'm trying to say is what do you take luck independent right, to be? Okay, so does it track, so now that we've got a concrete scenario in front right, of us, right, what do you right. take luck independent to be? Right, right. So, so what you're asking, I think if yeah. I were to formulate it in the way we thought about it, is what would be like the evidentiary yeah. threshold for sensitivity, right? Like what would be the probabilistic threshold for sensitivity? Sure, sure. And my answer would be I don't know. <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, we, we don't, it might be context dependent, right? It might be uh, different if we're, um, if, if it's a practical question, if it's like, I don't know, using statistical evidence to decide which uh, surgeon should operate on you, right? It would be different than conviction, than, uh, you know, so uh, believing or acting upon, right, might be different thresholds. So I, I have no answer to what, but, but this is like part of, as I said, like we're extending, uh, we're thinking, so this is one of the issues that we're thinking about, like, but, but we, I, I don't have an answer in terms of what would be, you know, the threshold for sensitivity. I just know that there is a notion of sensitivity. Um, but there are other ways to formulate this, um, and maybe they, they would, you would feel more comfortable with them given that I don't give you the threshold, which I don't have. Um, which is um, in terms of like normic support, right? So if I were to, um, if I were to let an eyewitness testify and she ended up misleading me, okay, um, and what she testified ended up being wrong, I would look for an explanation, right? I would ask, how did that happen? Whereas if I have, the, you know, probabilistically par evidence, but that is statistical in nature, and I ended up reaching a, an incorrect result as, you know, as a result of using it, I wouldn't demand an explanation, right? This is, like, this is the way statistics behave. Unlike, by the way, DNA evidence, where I would look for an explanation. So maybe, um, right, if, if, like a D, if you use the DNA and it led to a wrong result, a wrong outcome, we would usually look for an explanation. So this makes it a unique type of statistical evidence, whereas general statistical evidence, perhaps you would say, okay, this is just mere accident that happens when we use statistical evidence. Um, so this is maybe a, a, an easier way to, like, to uh, evade the, but, 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 I, but per your question, I don't have, we don't have um, you know, the, the threshold for sensitivity, what would be, like we just know that there is sensitive and insensitive types of uh, evidence. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> during your talk, you mm -hmm. indicated that we would, generally speaking, most people would be more uh, satisfied with a system that allowed insensitive data mm -hmm. if it arrived at a higher percentage of accurate results. Mm -hmm. Now, part of this might be how you're defining accuracy. Um, <coughs> for instance, letters like type one or type two mm -hmm, error. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about situations where, like there's two, there's wrongful convictions mm -hmm. or there's cases where uh, people who are guilty are acquitted. Mm -hmm. And so if inaccuracy encapsulates both of those, mm -hmm. then I think just to throw some numbers out to give it some concreteness, say a system that allows only sensitive data has a 60% accuracy rate or say 40% of the time it 
arrives at a incorrect result, mm -hmm. and the other system that um, allows for insensitive data is accurate 80% of the time. But then when we break down, you know, the results of those incorrect results, if the first system is, uh, say 35 per, of, the, of that 45, of that 40 percent, say mm -hmm. 35 are acquittals where the person uh, is guilty and there's only 5 percent of wrongful convictions, or in the other situation that's accurate 80 percent of the time, but of those 20 percent, say it's a 50-50 split, so 10 percent of the time mm -hmm. there's a wrongful conviction, we now have an increased rate of wrongful conviction Mm -hmm. And I think the general idea within um, the legal uh, theory, uh, especially within Canada, is that um, it is actually more desirable to have a greater level of inaccuracy if we are reducing the number of wrongful convictions. Yeah, of course. So, so this is an excellent you know, uh, question because it allows me to emphasize the point. When I'm talking about inaccuracy, it's not the number of mistakes in a system. Okay? It is the social cost of mistake, which is why I said that, for instance, um, um, you know, we c there is um, a good justification, perhaps, to use statistical evidence for exonerating purposes, but not for you know, conviction purposes, right? Because we don't treat, um, not all, as I said, not all errors in the criminal justice system are equal. And uh, the whole apparatus is, you know, the standard of proof of beyond a reasonable doubt, et cetera, is organized around um, minimization of the cost of error, but not the number of errors, right? So but by moving away from a preponderance of evidence to beyond a reasonable doubt, we know that we are probably, right, increasing the overall number of errors in the system, but it is um, in order to minimize the costly errors of um, false convictions, even if, if it's by way of increasing, you know, the likelihood and the rate of cheaper um, errors, which are, which are false acquittals. So when I'm talking about, you know, compare between two systems, one that is more inaccurate, one is, that is less, this is not more or less inaccurate in terms of numbers of mistake, but in terms of overall social cost, right? Uh, so, for instance, if, if I were to go according to, you know, to, if, if, I'd like to emphasize uh, according to where you're like uh, directing me, so a system where um, we would abolish the use of statistical evidence for exonerating purposes, right, but resort only to sensitive evidence, would that be a preferable system to live in, or would we rather live in a system that is more accurate in terms of, um, you know, uh, ensuring um, uh, or eliminating or minimizing the possibility of false convictions even by way of using non-sensitive evidence, okay? Hi there. Um, okay. I'd like to ask a question more to do with the application um, of the model here. So on the whiteboard, you drew a timeline right. of, yeah, you drew a timeline of basically the, ins the decreasing marginal costs of committing for a bad behavior, correct? Uh, of decreasing, uh, I'm not, no, so I'm saying it's not across the timeline, it's not like a linear decrease in the marginal cost. Okay. It's, it's, a, uh, this it's at this point yeah. that the use of the evidence would have a decrease, would decrease the marginal cost. Ah, but as I said, here it might actually have the opposite effect. Of course. Well, what I'm thinking is, okay, can we actually apply this? Because I, I know this was made in the context of talking about bad character mm -hmm, mm -hmm. E evidence mm -hmm. in criminal law. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking of something uh, of a sli slightly different context, a legal context. Is okay, instead of bad character evidence already in a criminal trial, is it possible to apply this to something, say, bad press relations? Uh, in a civil, in a more civil law sense, uh, where you're talking about defamation, considering whether you, a comp let's say a large corporation, okay. we were talking about uh, bad consumer reports, right? So, let's say a large corporation decides to market its pr products in a certain way, uh, and 
one, one thing leads to another, there's a lot of bad press. Uh, some of it might be true, some of it might be malicious. Mm -hmm. Who cares, right? But you, you know, that would then generate a record in a timeline, in mm -hmm. a linear timeline, the timeline would be linear, uh, of you know, all the things that people have, you know, have written about it. And if somebody, you know, a consumer then goes to consumer reports and looks it up, you know, their search results will basically be a full blast of you know, all, all the reviews that have been written about, about the company, right? So I'm thinking, okay, would, would there be an Im implication uh, in what we were saying, you know, what we were trying to apply this into mm -hmm. the criminal law, mm -hmm. bad character evidence context, would there be an application to a slightly different legal context in terms of what, you know, whether companies should consider what, you know, how they should behave Okay, so, so I, I think what I would answer here is, you know, the incentives that evidentiary rules create is one, you know, one factor in the equation that we need to take into account. But, you know, we also have to take the social costs into account. So, for instance, if I have a, a good reputation, okay, in some of the like extra legal arena, um, on the one hand, you know, we as society would want to perhaps induce me to build such a, a good record line, to be a good neighbor, to be a good, uh, right? Um, but then there's also, if, if we use this information, right, there's also a price in terms of false acquittals that we would be paying occasionally, and we have to, um, you know, weigh the costs and benefits as, as a society in this regard, and of course take into account other considerations that have nothing to do with incentives like deontological uh, morality, you know. Um, so, so this is, I think, is, is a general question in the way we formulate, right, our evidentiary uh, regimes, both in civil and uh, criminal trials. We know that, for instance, in the sentencing phase of trial, mm -hmm. a lot of this information is used, right, in criminal law, for instance, in sentencing. So once a good character is something that is that often, or a bad character, or prior convictions, et cetera, comes up. Um, the thing is that at the sentencing phase of trial, there is not the same incentive-inducing effect as, right? So, so we have, I'll, I'll put this, we ha in the criminal trial, um, we have good reason to elevate the expected punishment of for, for recidivism, right? Um, because people who have already accumulated um, uh, oh sorry. <laughs> a, a criminal record, right, and, and engaged second time in the offense, so first of all, there's um, diminishing costs to each additional year of, you know, be behind uh, pri prison walls. The first year is the most traumatic, is the most difficult. The second year is, you know, two years is are more difficult than one, but the second year is less difficult than the first year, right, because you've already grown accustomed uh, to the environment, more accustomed, et cetera. So, so there, you know, there's reason to, to pay this recidivism premium. Um, and uh, we've already maybe shown our you know, preference for criminal activity. So there are a lot of reasons why we would want to, um, in order to deter people from engaging in crime, if they already have a prior conviction, we would need a higher sort of sanction to deter them as compared to the general population. But, but the question is, should we do it, should we elevate the expected punishment through um, raising the probability of conviction or through the sentencing? And at the sentencing phase, we don't have these disincentives that, you know, the use of such information at the conviction phase would perhaps um, bring up. So this is at the criminal. A at the civil, you know, we can think of similar considerations that operates in, s in similar... Well, actually, if you don't mind me, well, okay, I think I'll put my cards on the table. And what I'm thinking specifically of is defamation. Mm -hmm, civil mm -hmm. you know, so, okay. It's not, you know, legally, the, 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 the material's not the same. I mean, the standard of burden, blah, 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 is not the same. Mm -hmm. But what I'm thinking is, okay, so you have a situation where the bad character, so to speak, is not really, like, the criminal bad character, mm -hmm. which you put, put in a trial, but you're having something or like a, just a, a lo long line of bad press, mm -hmm. which happens a lot now because there's so, there's so many mm -hmm. confu uh, review, um, consumer reviews mm -hmm. going on. But uh, of course, not not everybody reads it. But you know, if, if you find you know if you find a lot a lot of this and you hear about it year on and year on and year on, you might come to a slightly worse conclusion about you know this potential this potential brand or something, right? So it's basically a brand effect. And if you if you go into that context, then you know it's worth a little bit of money. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, if you go to defamation, so 
go to the, you know, go, go to what you were saying. It's talking about sentencing at the end of a criminal trial. You go to the, the end of a defamation trial and you win, right? The damages are mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that, right? You know, those, to the best of my knowledge, are not weighted in the mm-hmm. same way as you would use statistical evidence mm-hmm. for you know for cr- criminal sentencing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, the law. Okay, the law is completely different. Blah 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 blah. But I'm 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 focusing more on you know should there be something like a guideline as to you know or how, you know how much damage you know, how, how do you quantify the kind of damage to the reputation that you have and try to correlate that to the final you know to the final end result of mm-hmm, the trial mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. to speak. Yeah. No. No. So so I I I don't know how to like give you like a, you know how to quantify. Um, what I can say, like, are, are more general, like, principles in this in this regard. Uh, you know, in terms of, of taking into account character. So, at, at the si- in the civil realm, right? Um, again, the court has to s- to look at whether it's relevant or biasing information, and, and right, and and counterweight um, these two considerations. Um, it has to look at the incentives that are you know being set. It has to look at other facets of um, you know. Uh, deontological, uh, moral um, issues that may come up, and so this is one general, you know, point. Um, and the second general point that I want to make is in terms of like defamation versus criminal conviction. Th- that I, but this is a different project. Uh, I, I, I s- often like challenge the criminal civil divide. I think that um, uh, we have, you know, situations of liberty deprivation. Um, in the civil realm, uh, you know, like mental confinement, for instance, um, we have situations where children are taken away from their, you know, the custody of their parents in the civil realm. So there are very grave stakes and, and results and outcomes of civil trials as well. And I think that with these, with respect to these trials, this, the procedural and evidentiary safeguards that litigating parties should be accorded are, should be much heftier and much more substantial. So this is like in terms of the civil criminal uh, divide in this respect. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Mm. Yes? Mm. Sorry, at the risk of making you defend Sankariko again, (laughs) I just, uh, I have to say, I'm a little troubled by, I understand, I think, the argument that, that there's, uh, marginal cost difference mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that that creates uh, less deterrence for doing the second crime for someone mm-hmm. who's already got a criminal record if there's a rule that says the criminal record evidence can be used. But I'm worried about comparing, I'm worried about this marginality issue in the sense that if a person is deciding whether or not to steal a bike, then they can think about what are the probabilities that I'll get prosecuted for stealing the bike and what, but they can't really think about what's the probability of me being convicted for stealing the bike if the bike theft does not happen. So it seems to me like that if they don't do the crime, then the crime does not occur, like unless we're dealing with some kind of co-accused situation. So it seems to me what you're comparing is on the one hand, the sort of now it's just a, a low level probability of wrongful conviction for anything that they carry through their whole life as compared to the level of being correctly convicted if they actually do a particular thing. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I'm not sure those two things are comparable in any way. And I would also point out that although we have a problem with wrongful convictions, I think it's also true that the low level chance of wrongful conviction of any given individual is actually extremely low. So even if we were to say someone who has a criminal record is three times more likely to be wrongly convicted of something than someone mm-hmm. who doesn't have a criminal record, that means going from an extremely low probability to an also extremely low probability that's three times bigger. So I'm not really sure that I even buy the, I just wanted to throw right. that out to you. Yeah, so, so you know, the, the instance they say where uh, I don't buy, I don't steal the bike, the bike doesn't get stolen, right? This is, um, this would be the analogous case of the domestic violence, right, example that I gave. Um, and this is the case sometimes, right? But sometimes it's the gate crasher case where, you know, all the other people would still be gate crashing. So b- the m- my marginal contribution, right, in terms of is is to, to this offense not occurring is very negligible, right? It's uh, it's still slightly higher if I'm the thousandth person, person, right, and it's only 999 others. But it's but if you look at this base rate in terms of the uh, offense occurring, so my margin is very very negligible. Now think 
of the following example, again, from a practical point of view. Okay, so if I'm a sex offender, I'm a convicted sex offender living in a certain neighborhood, and I know that every time there will be a sex offense in this neighborhood, my name will come up, and I will be, right? And so, so I think this is a very real world situation. Um, and it's not one in which if I don't do it, I don't engage in this criminal activity, it's uh, the, the you know, baseline for uh, false conviction is almost zero. It's not the case, right? And it's enough that other people in the neighborhood would engage in this activity and I would immediately become suspect, right? So this is something that happens. Um, so, so as I said, of course, if I engage or don't engage like in the sexual offense, right, it's, it does change um, the percentage, the baseline, or the base rate for, for the occurrence of the, of the offense, but the question is by how much, right? And, and this I think people do take into account. And I think in our everyday life, right, we, um, if I'm the person who, who always gets, right, if I did something, I, I, always, I will always get blamed for it. Like we can think of a lot of situations where uh, something like this might take place or occur. Um,